Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So oh, we were picture. also fortunate to be awarded um, a Collaborative Research Award from the Lipedema Foundation to um, assess a novel approach to examine the adipose kinetics of lipedema. So here's our study team. Um, myself and Dr. Eric Ravison the Great are uh, MPIs on the study. And we have two co-investigators, Dr. Vance Alba, who's a bariatric surgeon at uh, Pennington Biomedical, as well as Dr. Steve Heimsfield, who's a guru in the field of body composition assessments. So given our team's interest in physiology as relates to body weight management, we were, as, we were especially intrigued by the characteristics which have been outlined in detail already, but specifically the characteristic that this adipose expansion in lipedema fat is not responsive to calorie restriction, weight loss, and exercise. So this led us to want to better understand what are the fundamental characteristics of the adipose tissue in patients with lipedema that could vary relative to individuals with traditional obesity that could potentially uh, impact the pathophysiology of lipedema. So I just demonstrated a couple of photos here. Uh, these were submitted to us via email on the same day that we advertised our lipedema study. And this uh, young lady shared the same sentiments as our panel member in that she was a previous a participant in a clinical trial at Pennington Biomedical some years ago. She was very successful at losing about 80 pounds, um, but since that time, she has not been able to maintain the weight, and as you can see demonstrated on the figure, uh, the lipedema in her legs has persisted. So in terms of our approach, our idea is to better understand the characteristics of lipedema specifically as relates to adipose tissue uh, expansion. So when we think about adipose expansion, I know this is not a comprehensive diagram, but we know that adipose expansion is characterized by hyperplasia, which is an increase uh, in cell number of adipocytes, as well as hypertrophy, an increase in size. And many lines of evidence has, have demonstrated the importance of adipose expansion in metabolic health. So this is a figure that I pulled from a review highlighting the idea that during positive energy balance, as long as there is a, there is, um, um, a healthy combination of hypertrophy and hyperplasia, that the excess lipid can be safely stored in the subcutaneous adipose tissue and metabolic homeostasis can be maintained. However, if there are limits in the adipose tissue's ability to expand, during chronic positive energy balance, we know that this could lead to um, lipid spillage, ectopic fat storage, and metabolic uh, disruption. And so what's interesting about this ex adipose expandability hypothesis is that this idea of hyperplasia has become a hot topic or focus. Um, it's thought that impaired hyperplasia uh, is what can cause an individual to be at risk for obesity-related diseases, but evidence from our lab as well as others have demonstrated that this um, idea is a lot more complex than previously thought. So we are one of the few groups uh, that is utilizing a deuterium labeling approach, uh, the stable isotope deuterium, to measure the dynamics of adipose uh, tissue expansion. So this method works by subjects drinking deuter deuterium labeled water. Over the course of eight weeks, the deuterium becomes enriched in not only the body water, but also in the adipose cells of the individual. And there are many measurements that you can um, obtain, but for our purposes, uh, we're interested in looking at adipose cell formation and triglyceride synthesis um, uh, in vivo. So we first applied this uh, deuterium labeling approach uh, in a study, the apple and pear study. And no, we were not looking at the effects of eating apples and pears, which many people thought. We were looking at body shape and trying to better understand the characteristics of fat distribution in individuals with obesity. And so here are the characteristics of the individuals listed there. These were all women uh, with obesity. And what we did was we provided the deuterium labeled water over the course of eight weeks. And at the end um, of the study, we obtained uh, clinical data. We collected adipose tissue biopsies, uh, body composition assessments, uh, blood samples, et cetera. 
And so this is published data, and I won't go into detail, but the basic understanding is that the results that we obtained were the opposite of our hypothesis. So there's this idea that as long as you can create new fat cells or have enhanced fat cell formation or hyperplasia, that you could possibly be protected from metabolic dysfunction. Actually, what we found was that individuals with obesity that had higher fat cell formation actually also had more visceral fat. Uh, they were less insulin sensitive, and they also had um, an increased number of metabolic syndrome risk factors. So this data demonstrated that the idea of adipose expansion, specifically as relates to hyperplasia or new fat cell formation, are quite complex. And it wasn't just our lab. There have been other reports in the literature that have seen, um, that observed data similar to this uh, and have published data as well. So because we know that the adipose expansion in individuals with traditional obesity are very complex, we uh, propose that the um, adipose expansion in lipedema is also uh, just as complex. And so our idea is to utilize this metabolic labeling approach to measure the characteristics of adipose uh, remodeling in patients with lipedema that may contribute to the pathogenesis of, of obesity. Uh, and here, our idea is to compare the characteristics that we observe in lipedema patients with our existing cohort of the apple pear study, for which we've already um, obtained clinical data and adipose assessments. So our study is ongoing. We're currently enrolling women who are premenopausal between 18 and 45 years of age, BMI less than 60, and a clinical diagnosis of lipedema. Vance Alba, the um, co-investigator, is he sees quite a few uh, patients in his bariatric unit with patients, so he's been helpful uh, in terms of referring us patients. And he is the one conducting the screening and uh, confirming the clinical diagnosis of, of lipedema. So at the start of the study, we screen the individuals, we collect blood and other um, clinical data assessments. Our goal is to enroll 20 women with lipedema. They'll undergo eight weeks of the deuterium labeling protocol. We'll collect fat biopsies, and we'll also do um, you know, some innovative uh, body imaging as well. So in terms of our hypothesis, it's just that uh, we expect higher adipose uh, cell formation in individuals with, with lipedema as compared to um, other women with traditional obesity from the apple and pear study. And we'll also look at uh, triglyceride synthesis, which could be an indirect measure of hypertrophy. And we also propose that they'll have uh, enhanced triglyceride synthesis uh, relative to uh, women with the traditional obesity. So if you look in the literature, you can see a few um, uh, highlights just demonstrating how the characteristics of adipose tissue and lipedema uh, can be different uh, versus traditional obesity. So we hope to uh, add to the literature uh, in this regard. And so in terms of our study progress, uh, to date, we've web screened quite a few individuals since we started the study. But as you can see, um, we've only... Uh, if you look at the number of in-person screening visits, you can see the numbers decline drastically, and that's because it is, you know, difficult uh, in terms of recruiting this population, especially um, confirming the diagnosis and some of the other inclusion-exclusion criteria that we have um, for enrolling. So we've had eight enrolled so far, uh, and we have five who've completed the study, and we have two in progress. So if I were to highlight some of our recruitment challenges is age. So one of the previous speakers mentioned um, about these, you know, changes uh, in lifespan in women, especially, you know, during puberty, menopause, et cetera. And so we have quite a few interested individuals who are beyond uh, our age range. We chose to exclude them for this study because, again, we are comparing them to an existing cohort in the apple pear study, and we had an age cutoff there, so we wanted to make sure that our populations were similar in that regard. The diagnosis of lipedema has been more complex. We've had quite a few women to come and think they have lipedema, but uh, they do not. We've also had quite a few who have lymphedema, and because we know that lipedema and lymphedema are different, we wanted to be sure to exclude those 
uh, individuals that do not have lipedema. Uh, and then other inclusion exclusion criteria and also weight st instability has been a big factor. So because we're looking at adipose kinetics and turnover, um, we want them to be relatively weight stable, which can be a challenge because again, many of these patients have been prescribed uh, medications that could um, cause their weight to fluctuate within the past three to six months. And here I'm just showing a diagram of a recent um, lipedema patient that we've had uh, and just showing some of the other clinical data that we're collecting. So these, study, these assessments were done in Steve Himes, Himesfield's lab. So he does quite a bit of uh, 2D and 3D imaging uh, in his lab. So we're able to capture, you know, lots of photographs, develop, um, obtain lots of um, data in terms of circumferences and other characteristics uh, as assessed by these body composition assessments. What we've also learned is that we have to be very careful in terms of how we characterize um, the data that we see from the body composition assessments because this is our first time, you know, analyzing this specific population of individuals. And we know that using, you know, these existing methodologies, sometimes there can be differences in looking at this patient population versus those with uh, traditional obesity. So I think uh, the field looks bright in terms of lipedema. We're hoping to utilize our project to add uh, more data to the literature, and hopefully if lipedema and TOS continue to collaborate, maybe we'll get a chance to uh, highlight some of our research findings at a later time. I want to thank all my collaborators uh, at Pennington and the study team, and with that, I'll yield my time.